So thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon to think together uh, about the architecture of refugees, the question of ethics. <coughs> I'll try to be brief. Three questions. Why now? Why ethics? Why architecture? Why now? Today the world is witnessing the greatest movement of the uprooted that the world has ever known. The United Nations High Commission uh, for Refugee reports that the number of displaced people is at the highest ever, surpassing even post-World War II numbers. When the world was struggling to come to terms with the most devastating event in history. Today, some 65 million people have been displaced from their homes. 20 million of them are in danger, victims of politics, war or natural catastrophe. According to the HCR, 1% of the Earth population is an asylum seeker, internally displaced or refugee. Why ethics? Significant transformation in the world political landscape are signaling the emergence of a new world order that undermines the certitude established at the end of World War II. At the core of such discussions, the concept of human rights is significantly challenged, calling for a discussion at the core of ethics, for the revision of the principles and mechanisms of intervention. Many states are flouting international agreements designed to address the refugee question. The United Nations human rights experts are calling on government around the world to honor their commitments by taking actions for a fairer society. Ensuring human dignity for everyone needs appropriate social justice policies to be implemented, not only domestically, but also globally. Their joint statement is as follows. Every human being has the right, quote, sorry, every human being has the right to a standard of living that ensures adequate health and well-being for individuals and their families. This includes access to food, clothing, housing, healthcare, and social services. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which sets out these rights, also makes clear that all people are entitled to social and international order in which their rights and freedoms can be fully realized. In order to achieve sustainable peace in the world, we must all work for social justice in international solidarity. In awarding the Nobel Prize to the ILO in 1969, the Nobel Prize Committee referred to the motto of the international agency. If you want peace, cultivate justice. Why architecture? The workshop addresses the agency of architecture and design in a context where the disrespect of human rights is aggravated by the incapacity of global institutions to react efficiently. What are the ethical questions regarding the architecture of refugees? What time scales, short or long, represent a priority for architecture and through which agenda? Refugee relief, historical preservation, camps upgrade and daily life or rebuilding and displacement? Where is the role of design in front of the degra de de degradations and destructions of cultural artifacts? How can design be channeled towards peace building objectives and possible resettlement projects? What are the material, technological, systemic responses to address emergency needs in the context of refugee camps? So I want to thank all of you for being gathered around this table. And I would like to start by one question to all of you guys. The many transformations in the world political landscape have undermined the efforts done at the end of World War II. To imagine a set of principles and mechanisms to address issues that engage the responsibility of the world as a community. The creation of the institution of the United Nations in 1945 was an attempt to save succeeding generations from the curse of war, to prevent environmental crises and deterioration, to ensure economic, social, cultural rights to the people. 
My question is what is your position in relation to the international framework within which we are operating to consider the issue of the global refugee crisis? <coughs> is, the intergovernment, is the intergovernmental organization promoting international cooperation still able to perform its role? Some independent experts, such as Alfred Desires, advocate for reform, while others advocate for the replacement altogether of the United Nations by a, federations, a federation of the earth or other institutions. Should we reform or replace the UN? How much the problem is coming from the existence of an institution that is simply not organized to solve global and supranational problems? That's a good question, I must say. So, um, yes, you and I can again share with you my experience. Uh, when I was refugee, I was not believing in anything that uh, was happening. And, uh, and uh, in that uh, specific context, it was really not, uh, it, within our community, it was not considered as a reliable. <laughs> Thing. So you just uh, try to, to go through your decisions uh, uh, feeling completely alone uh, in that specific case. I must say, uh, um, I would connect on, on, uh, on these rights uh, that you mentioned in, in your, uh, in your uh, um, speech. It's, uh, I believe there, there are aspects that uh, we should take into consideration when it comes to uh, intervening to, uh, uh, and, and interacting with refugees. We need to consider them as uh, normal people that uh, go, that live normal lives and go through their uh, uh, challenges as we do it here. Uh, and, uh, and in my personal experience, and I think that could be the key for uh, uh, impacting that uh, specific community is to, to uh, give them the opportunity to uh, get education, which is uh, maybe fifth point in all that list of rights. I would move it quite uh, up in the list because this, is, uh, this worked for me, but I believe it could work for many others uh, in, uh, in uh, really allowing uh, people to, to to learn, and uh, you don't need to go far in in uh, any of kind of uh, uh, teachings <laughs> around the you to to realize that that is the key. You need to learn, and if we give them the opportunity to learn, is uh, one uh, one uh, of the milestones of that uh, intervention uh, that uh, you know uh, we should uh, we should put on our uh, our list. And uh, second thing is job. And I, I'm really surprised how a little is, uh, is uh, or how we use that uh, job issue, that working permit that I was not given, even though I was uh, really very successful, uh, to give the opportunity to live a normal life like any other person in this world. And, uh, and job is the key of success, in my opinion. So, so there are two, two aspects that, again, I, I, you see, I dig into my personal <laughs> life, but, but I think there are uh, these two aspects that we should work on to actually impact, make real impact. In, uh, and, and the beauty and difference between what I went through and what these uh, uh, new generations of refugees go through is that we live in a new world in a digital world that actually offers <laughs> gives opportunities to democratize both education and job market and uh, and I think this, these are directions that again give us opportunity to treat a refugee as a normal I, I like to cite the uh, um, Hamdi uh, Chobani uh, words in which he says uh, once you give a job to a refugee is not anymore refugee 
and this is uh, really a striking uh, statement and I totally share uh, share that statement because eventually what you, what we need to do is to give every single person in this world the opportunity to live their lives and not uh, putting uh, sticks into the wheels uh, uh, through all these uh, working permit issues, uh, migration issues. That's my uh, vision. In, in, uh, and and, uh, and um, I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, uh, I, I think it's important that we uh, discuss this together. This is a very large question, uh, but something that um, well, those of us who are trained in international law, we, um, of course, uh, have been sort of uh, both responsible for the crisis with the meltdown of the system that you correctly identify, but also thinking about and imagining alternatives. There have been enough proposals for uh, replacement, for example, the intergovernmental system with other sorts of uh, options. Um, you know, um, if, if, for example, a framework based on cities uh, or a framework based on uh, direct election of individuals, uh, kind of a world parliament of a sort, uh, doing away with the global coordination entirely, but instead uh, have horizontal networks, actually essentially uh, deterritorialized networks, essentially um, uh, link with each other on a functional basis. Uh, there have been all sorts of uh, proposals over the years, but I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm I remain my feet are kind of on the ground in many ways, and I like to see proposals that might have a plausible way of you know working themselves out in the real world. Uh, in the real world, I do think that uh, it's I. I it's very hard to see the entirely uh, the entire disappearance of something called the nation state, and uh, I also think that it not, might not necessarily be a good idea for something called the nation state to disappear, um, for a variety of different reasons. Um, people who live in particular territories remain committed to uh, identification with their fellow, you know. Uh, members based on some sort of identification uh, based on some imagined past or imagined traditions of uh, some kind and they actually uh, constitute um, a very powerful pull factor uh, that brings people together and uh, the structure of uh, rules that we have that impose obligations on countries are built on uh, the relationship between uh, these kinds of communities, self-imagined communities, that uh, constitute themselves as um, as, as states. Uh, at least in the near future, I don't see at least uh, alternatives emerging that are robust enough to completely replace the current system. Um, what we might end up having, of course, is the simultaneous presence of uh, perhaps many different forms of governance emerging. Um, and here, uh, what I would uh, say, particularly as it comes to um, as it comes to uh, refugees, is uh, there is there needs to be a reinvestment of time and effort into rebuilding the global framework. The reality is that the global frameworks that were established in the 1940s have uh, slowly lost their uh, their you know ability to uh, influence events on the ground and to be effective. And there needs to be more of a reinvestment of effort and time into rebuilding and re-innovating those global institutions. Uh, perhaps, uh, as I referred to earlier during my presentation, if uh, the new global compacts that uh, are going to be adopted if things go well on migration and refugees in 2018 are structured uh, you know, sufficiently uh, you know, uh, um, engineered sufficiently uh, broadly and effectively, perhaps they might be able to address some of the some of the issues uh, that uh, ultimately lead to refugee flows. Because um, the, the the fact that we need a global organization and a global normative framework for dealing with migration as a whole, not simply refugees, 
has been uh, known for quite a while. Um, many, many years ago, Jagdish Bhagwati, uh, uh, economist at uh, Columbia University, made a call for a global organization on migration and called for compacts between countries and regions that would essentially allow for a free movement of population around the world. Similar to, for example, the assumption that we have that goods and services should have free movement around the world, you know, essential foundation of free trade theory. He was essentially making the argument that, you know, we need to think about the movement of, you know, labor and movement of people around the world as a free circulating, you know, commodity, essentially. Uh, that, of course, he was coming at it from an economic uh, perspective. But the proposals have been there for a while. And uh, so I'm very curious to see how the new redesign of institutions uh, is going to work out. Um, the, the only other thing I would say about, um, in the light of what I said earlier in my remarks, uh, the one thing I would say about the limits of the current system, uh, which I do think will continue in one form or another, uh, meaning the system of nation states. Uh, one of the major limits of the current system is the exclusive and untrammeled right that it gives to nation states to decide who comes in and who goes, the complete control they have over territory. And going with that, their ability to determine, essentially, what happens to populations who live within them. Um, the question of, uh, especially, as I said earlier, the ethics of intervention issue. How do you intervene in situations where massive atrocities are happening that are generating refugee flows across, that are crossing frontiers is actually one of the most vexing moral and political questions of our time for which there is no easy answer. Conceptually, some of the breakthrough work was done by Francis Deng, who was the you know, uh, first uh, UN special representative on IDPs when he and others uh, came up with the formulation of sovereignty, uh, not as a right of countries, but as a responsibility. That the idea that sovereignty should have responsibility is an idea that uh, was uh, quite uh, seriously pushed by many scholars and policy people uh, for almost close to two decades from the late 90s until the UN General Assembly actually acknowledged that in the form of something called R2P, or Responsibility to Protect Doctrine. Unfortunately, because as I said earlier, of the, of the unreliable and abusive record of the West in using any humanitarian argument that comes its way for its own selfish purposes, and because of the fact that we don't have global systems that can ensure that abuse of that kind of, you know, uh, uh, those arguments can be prevented, for example, Security Council uh, reform uh, completely solved. Because of these institutional deficiencies, although conceptually we have actually some very interesting ways forward to reform the system that came in the 1940s, we are yet not able to operationalize them. Uh, that to me remains one of our biggest challenges. I actually, um, yeah. <laughs> I actually would like to pick up a little bit on what Raj was saying because I think, I don't know if I'm that in the same way that you are to speak to the UN as an institution or the UN as a policy one, but perhaps more to the work or understanding a bit um, from, of Rwanda on the ground. Um, the critique for me is of the dominant or conventional approaches uh, to such issues such as peace building and questioning it, questioning kind of international philosophies or even um, best practices or typical practices when it comes to dealing with either refugees or with post-conflict situations. Um, so in, in the case that I work in, it's, it's the, the issue of peace building in Rwanda. So the question here is not only the ethics of if we should intervene, it is more fundamentally, I think, uh, or as fundamentally, a question of how we should intervene. And that becomes a true ethical dilemma if we start to question the real foundations or the motivations, or even the ethics of peace building as they're commonly understood. So this becomes where I can start, or others can start to mount a critique of orthodoxy, of liberal peace building or orthodoxy in this case. So that's the first set of reactions, I suppose, that came um, in response to the question. 
Um, and, and then I think the question also engages a bit um, with this, this uh, uh, distinction or set of debates between uh, a universalist versus a, a particular or a relativist approach to ethics, right? So there would be a set of uh, philosophers or, or thinkers who would say that, you know, would start to question fundamentally for whom or what is the universal? idea of peace, right? or where is that ethics, who just designs, defines the, the ethics from which we operate, for whom does that ethics operate, um, in what context, in which historical time is, is a particular set of ethics uh, developed. Um, and, and that would be a kind of communitarian, perhaps, approach to understanding a universal view, right? And then the universalists might then contest that and say, well, uh, well, particularity or relativism devolves into uh, um, a kind of more insular or closed set of ethical standards or moral standards or values, which has its extreme example in Nazism. Um, so this is the typical counterexample between the universalist and the particularist perspective. Um, but then again, we might say, we counter that again by saying, within any one society or historical time or space or place, any one country, any society, we can take and understand that Nazism, bigotry, racism, racism does not exist in a vacuum. There are other dissenters within that society. There's a way to challenge that set of views or values as not morally worthy. Um, so, you know, that's another way of thinking about this. It's a kind of an unending dilemma between a particular point of view and a universal and negotiation, negotiating between those. But perhaps in the end, what's important here is to always question the universal, to question the convention, question the dominant point of view. And one way to start to maybe perhaps do that is to start to connect um, the ethics with the politics and to have them work with each other. Um, and, and in that case, intervention and how we intervene and the evaluation of that intervention, so what is actually being done and what impacts it has, that's perhaps where we start to feed back into that legal set debates. So it's not just theory, it's also has to do with people. I mean, I will, I will talk from the architectural point of view, right? Because uh, um, what I think is that what, what we cannot deny is that basically the, uh, the, the culture in which we, we operate as architects and or as creators or, or, or cultural like, processes, somebody that is working on the cultural process of architecture, and it, that reality um, it, like organizations like, uh, like, like global organizations, let's say organizations that has the spirit of, of operating globally, have a, have an impact in the world, right? And, and, and definitely are part of the landscape. But I would uh, the first thing I would say is that um, as an architect, I think that it's important to evaluate also the role the, the role of other agents in the construction of the built environment today, right? It's, and when we are looking at um, corporate um, um, organizations, right, that might have like a, a similar impact that the UN is having in a specific moment, right? Or we can imagine um, a, spe a specific moment of exception, right, in which uh, the uh, normative like um, processes of, of negotiation of, of sovereignty are uh, being suspended. You know? For example, I'm, I'm thinking now of, of Kelly work on extra state craft, right? And how actually elements that are both the state are actually modifying certain certain regulations and certain operations that affect our built environment. And by 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 saying that affect the built environment, uh, I'm referring that it, it affects the migration processes, right? If, if there is something that is accelerating and, and uh, operating in our daily lives, not only in a specific groups that we can indicate as refugees, we are all like a, in a certain level connected and affecting and affected by transit, right, and migration. So, so I think that the, uh, the first thing I would say is that, that that combination of, yes, the UN might be one of the agents, but we, we should, as architects, understand that, that that is not the only agent that is being um, um, modifying sort of things. And, and my, but my second, my second response to it is, is how, 
the importance of organizations, right? Uh, like a weird, uh, and, and, I, and I agree with you that the importance of understanding new forms of organ organizational processes, right? And how organizations can really affect um, um, situations um, that we are discussing today. And, and, and in that sense, I would refer back to, to, the pro to the project of the embassy as something that was an organization produced in a specific moment with a, with a, with not a, with a state behind and uh, with a specific agency and with the, with the capacity to find a bridge in the system in order to operate. Right? So I think that uh, what, what, um, in, the, in the understanding of what is the role of the UN or the role of these kind of organizations, we have to rethink new forms of agency that can be produced with organizational systems or, or co construction of community that are not following the same systems that, that, um, that we have known in, in, previous, in previous cases or in bigger, bigger, bigger examples. Um, yeah, I, I would maybe try to bring these very um, difficult questions, you know, into um, into also more um, an understanding, for example, in my personal case of uh, United Nations Relief Work Agency, which is the the agency that was created ad hoc for Palestinian uh, refugees, and um, of course most of the Palestinians, let's say. Um, have a sort of hate relations with this uh, UN agency. So, um, in, in one way, of course, is the agency that perpetuated, you know, in some form makes sustainable uh, their refugeehood, you know, and the fact that uh, doesn't have any political mandate, you know, it perpetuates this sort of humanitarian uh, dimensions. At the same time, if you say that you are going to dismantle UNRWA today, they'll say no. So, and I think what, that, what this says to me is that I think it's, we, don't have, we don't have shortcut solutions. Um, the only political struggle that I know is to work with the present colonial conditions and trying to reinvent from there possibility for different users, which is what the Palestinians, for example, did uh, in the camps and what also they did with UNRWA since years. You know, if you, if you also read the history of UNRWA, it's not this monolithic idea of, you know, you know UN uh, has its own history and, um, and has been pulled, you know, in so many different directions, you know, until today, for example, you know, Israel will be the first one who will be happy to dismantle UNRWA to say Palestinians, you know, are like anyone else. Um, so, I think we, yeah, it's, it's good to be careful, you know, in, in, in trying to to understand how we get out from the situations which we all feel we are trapped into this idea of the nation state that most of the people I would say would agree that doesn't work so some people say you know we have reform some people we have to think everything um, I would you know more modestly in the way how we uh, we approach that also in, I will talk more from an architectural perspective so I will not get lost is um, is how we reuse for example the uh, uh, the World Heritage of UNESCO, of UNESCO, for example. So we were very much interested in the history of refugee camp. And we would have made you know, that claim to be you know, the importance of, it, of that. But we said, why don't we actually really build the evidence and make a case using the, uh, the application format that UNESCO is providing you know, in order for state, by the way, only state can nominate World Heritage site, I mean, I don't think we have, you know, criticizing that is so easy, you know? I mean, how you can have a universal claim when then it's the only nation state can nominate what everybody of the universe should agree <laughs> that that is actually a world heritage site. It's such an easy critique, I think it's, we cannot stop there. I think our task is actually how to use that structure, you know, to, uh, to be worked in a way that both is practically effective at the same time, it leads us to a different place. And the way how this was done, I mean, in our case, it worked, it was in some way accepting that that, as if you have to accept that you inhabit a colonial building. And the history of decolonization is such an interesting history that, you know, we know very little, or at least, you know, the West know very little about it, that could give so many important lessons in the way how you use a structure that was built with certain aims, 
and you turn it on its head for different aims, you know, with all the difficulties, of course, of doing that operation, and there is no easy solution for that. But in this case, for us, it was a way to mobilize a different understanding of what constitutes heritage, that this discussion is to happen, and more importantly, you know, who has the right to say that is heritage or not? You know, I would challenge to say that why an old city, let's say, in, uh, in a place, you know, is more important than the Haitian refugee camp with its history of 70 years old, which is inscribed in its urban fabric and can be narrated and, and you know, can make, and has a relevance for the world. It's not just a relevance for the nation itself. And I think when we start to look at these strategies, I would say we already realize that we are beyond the nation states because there are so many people who already live, you know, I think they already live, you know, in the conditions that is beyond the nation state. And what is today, I mean, do we really believe that the Middle East will go back into a nation state? I don't think so. It, that, it will, these boxes will not, you know, it, it, it's very painful because, you know, we know how it's painful not to be a citizen. You know, not to be covered by this nation state. But you know, it would be also very, I think, similarly, you know, it's, it's very, it's an illusion to think that the Middle East, you know, you get Syria back again, and you get Iraq back again. You know, Lebanon maybe was never really a state. Uh, you know, what is Israel? Is a nation state? Where is its territory? You know, that, for example, if you look carefully that area, you understand that we use again, you know, a way to understand things that actually they don't already fit the reality because the majority of the Palestinians, they don't live in, you know, they are already all uh, carrying different nationalities. So they are de facto already living beyond this nation state, of course, paying heavy consequences of that. But to me, is what we can learn from that condition in order then to build something different than then trying to fix back something that will never go back. Thank you. Let's let's uh, move on from the question of ethics and politics and the sort of intertwined condition. It's uh, you know who decides what is heritage, who decides what uh, is sort of a, a symbolic uh, structure, and uh, what are the repercussions of of doing that, and how do uh, communities uh, relate to this political decision? Is a is is a is a very deep and uh, very interesting question. I would like to move on from this sort of question about frameworks to a question about uh, intervention and transformation. Uh, so in relation to the pro process of reconstruction of a community after war, after a traumatic event, uh, how, uh, how is it possible to imagine that they are on the ground conflicting forces that will try to build this sort of consensual space. Uh, are, uh, my, my question is maybe to Delia, Alessandro, and maybe Admir, uh, how do you start with conflicting forces on the ground and, and wish and have the wish to build a collective, a collective space? So how do you start with conflicting forces on the ground to build a kind of consensus of sorts or consensual space? In Rwanda, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting type of question because consensus is developed top-down and distributed and decentralized. <laughs> there is no real consensus. It's not a product uh, space. Um, and so you... Uh, dissent at your peril. There's very strong repercussions for doing so. Uh, so in a way, I think a lot of my work in Rwanda is focused on finding small places, small utterances, uh, even that are not vocalized, because perhaps that's more that's stronger. But oftentimes, as understood through the built environment, as a form of resistance, as a form of difference, as an articulation of affiliation with the government policy or an, an agreement at the same time, but I'd rather do it this way, you know. So an example here would be 
you know, any number of the model villages, I mentioned briefly one of them, um, where the government has a very clear idea, a committed settlement with very rational principles of equal state, equally spaced houses with uniform design um, in placed in a tabula rasa, and everyone must come to resettle and conform. But when you do that, when you operate on a model of consensus, and you don't listen to difference, in communities in which uh, are being cobbled together by the resettlement, then you miss the different histories and experiences of the individuals and the families that are being brought together. And you miss the opportunities uh, to try and foster forms of reality, neighborliness, etc. And you end up antagonizing a lot of teachers. I'm speaking a bit in generalities. Specifics, right? I suppose the idea here is to find ways to listen to dissensus, to allow conflict to be read, um, and also to find ways to, to think about forming community that are not just Maybe without this, I don't know what you have in mind, without disrupting, um, let's say, these conversations, but also I felt a little bit, um, they have been so patient. I was wondering if also there is a moment that we can, uh, you know, get a little bit of, um, of questions that would be also from outside so that we can open up. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to, to hear also, since we have been talking a lot, and, uh, and I enjoyed that very much, but also I felt I would like to hear a little bit more from uh, from the public, if possible, if it's not instructing. Oh, okay, so we'll open up uh, the floor to questions from the public. Um, hi, um, <coughs> hi um, thank you so much for uh, the wonderful presentations and just having a space here to talk about these very, very large and complex <laughs> questions. Um, I wanted to just further complicate it um, by asking about, we're talking about ethics, but it's a little confusing for me because the question of ethics is always associated with the question of who is the so-called agent, you know, to whom this ethical framework should apply. We've talked about international institutions, international legal, uh, frameworks, but um, we're, and we've talked about, of course, the role of architects and people who are producing spaces, but um, as I understand it, uh, refugees are big business as well. There's a whole industry that has been developed over the last few decades um, around serving the needs of refugees and of internally di displaced people in urban and rural areas. These refugee camps have huge supply chains associated with them, huge development actors, and many of us here in academia are also in the business of both representing, creating knowledge about, and you know, responding to the needs and crises of various disasters or um, wars they, as they come up in the last few decades. Um, and this is a recurrent thing. So I'm just curious from, you know, just if each of you could take just like one or two minutes to reflect on this question of ethical praxis as an individual and where you see some of the challenges of negotiating the, the unethical dimensions of the various actors who are at play and who have an interest in both perpetuating the problem because it makes them money um, uh, or creates opportunities to create write books about it. Um, and, you know, where in your own personal practice you find some kind of um, still space to operate and address these concerns. I, th I think that's a great question. Uh, at least as an international lawyer, human rights lawyer, works a lot with governments, communities, and uh, also having worked in a post-conflict setting after a war in Cambodia for many years, I, um, I can say at least as far as uh, my position is concerned, um, some of the biggest uh, quandaries actually uh, come from the fact that, uh, you know, human rights, while they express ethical values, I've been a human rights lawyer for 25 years now, 
they express ethical values. Human rights talk is not the same thing as ethics talk. Those are two different things. Uh, partly because of, well, because of many reasons, but I'll point to one reason why this is important. Human rights are expressed, you know, and have salience and have traction because they're expressed as obligations of states. And otherwise, it's a bunch of pious aspirations that we can all ignore, basically. You know, this will be no different from, for example, a bunch of obligations that religious people call for. I mean, it, it can be any form of, you know, call for rightful conduct. You know, uh, the reason why human rights have a particular purchase on public policy in particular, uh, and on political action, why people are able to mobilize around them, and they're able to use institutions, such as in Palestine. Constantly there's a reliance on human rights. Why? Because of the link with law, and that link with law provides a link with state. While that's its strength, I've always felt that in my practice it's also the main weakness. Because it limits us to the boundaries and the frameworks that are implied by our very reliance on the state. To be committed to the idea that we have to realize ethics through rights talk also actually restricts you to the range of possibilities implied in that the, the mechanism called the state. You're over-reliant on it, and it's not possible to escape it beyond a point. So, so what people like me have tried to do is to strategize about how to keep the state while trying to sort of weaken some of its worst impulses in one way or the other, or how to find strategic opportunities to for example, seep some other resistance from non-state spaces, such as by social movements or others, into the spaces that are traditionally occupied by state-led elites. How do we actually disrupt that? And that's actually one that can be done only by practice. I think that's, to me, one of the big challenges. Yeah, I would say, um, um, again, talking from, from the architectural point of view, that also there are different levels of, of how you respond to, to, um, to this issue, right? I, I believe, I'm, um, as an architect, I believe in, in the, uh, the importance of bringing the discussion to the table as the first step towards like, uh, all these questions that you are putting on the table, right? Like, uh, we have to think, for example, when we started with the After Blogging Project, like, none of these issues were like broadly discussed in schools of architecture, literally, right? No, no, there are examples of certain practices that have been developing and these kind of discussions, but as a general understanding of what architecture was, was no like discussion whatsoever about human rights or um, the importance of understanding migration as part of you, what you need to deal with as an architect. Right? So I think that like a, there are like a different reactions of how your practice operates and different levels of, of operation. So, so I think, um, and, and, and in relation to that, uh, I, I would come back to, to the question of organizations before, right? Like, the, like, a, like the, the, the power or capacity that the Aga Khan Foundation can have, for example, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big agent, right? It, it can be, it can produce a, a, big, a big modification and, and constructing processes of ethics that can be broadened up to the discipline of architects, right? So, so I, I believe in, in, the, uh, in the importance of, of gestures and, and, and positions that you might have as an individual or as a group of people that are of, you know, having a conversation today here <coughs> and that can have consequences in, the, uh, in a major scale, uh, uh, bigger scale. Uh, because at the end of the day, what I believe is in the importance of understanding that architecture has to take the tools and the techniques to really confront complex issues. Right? Because that's something that somehow is, it's, it's been um, conventionally understood that architecture is somehow a discipline that is relegated from these issues, that is separated from, from complexities as we use. And, and, and that doesn't mean that architecture is the response, but definitely architecture is better than it and has the capacity to test out or rehearse certain processes. I think um, uh, I could connect with this uh, aspect of state versus glo globalization, both aspects that uh, were, were mentioned. And, uh, and I think we, we have the opportunity to to explore that new dimension of globalization 
uh, through uh, new tools, digital tools, to actually go beyond borders. And I think this, uh, uh, at least in the sense of conversation and uh, exchange of, of information, I think this could be the, the, the new dimension that uh, uh, we should start exploring uh, uh, more systematically. Let's put it in this way, uh, find a way that the uh, that, uh, state is not controlling refugee camp in, uh, uh, in uh, Jordan uh, in terms of uh, access to internet. We, we need to find a way to actually have voice of, of all together, uh, bring it into a conversation and uh, be able to find the tools that are recognized universally uh, to start conversation about all these things and have voice from uh, everyone when it comes to uh, uh, you know conversation about all these issues. Questions? Uh, thank you so much for great presentations. Uh, I think we've been talking a lot about nations, nation states, there's an interesting tension. If we, if we let go, if we move past the nation, nation state, are we letting that scale of governance, of ability to act off the hook? There's, there's, a, you know, there, there's, a, there's an inherent stability or a perception of stability and protection, um, infrastructure, building codes, reliable standards. As we, if we increasingly move towards impermanence and formality, incrementality, fluidity, what do we, what do we gain and what do we lose? Simple question. <laughs> yeah. uh, if I can uh, just uh, comment on this, I think it's a natural way of uh, uh, of uh, what we observe in in economy or any. Uh, either field where technology is in, impacting seriously uh, our uh, our uh, Italian mafia taxi network that is completely upset by Uber. Okay, so so what what I think is uh, is really the the opportunity to bring this conversation uh, into a new dimension, new space that again uh, will be defined altogether, but uh, but will give us the opportunity to to go beyond these obstacles that I lived seriously through all my steps from refugee camp to MIT professorship here. Um, and I think, again, uh, uh, it's a new dimension that uh, is, again, upsetting uh, Italian taxi drivers uh, uh, and uh, could upset many people, but uh, actually, maybe when it comes to ethics is, is a new dimension that would bring us into uh, unexplored territories and also opportunities to make this world better when it comes to 65 million refugees that are right now living in those camps. Well, in the interest of time getting more questions, uh, I think I should just... Thank you. Sorry. Thank you for your talk. Um, I had a question from a sort of economic point of view. So I just finished Paul Collier's book on the um, on sort of migration generally and what can be done with it. And he argues that the West shouldn't accept more migrants because I think he quotes the figure that 10% um, of all migrants or all the absolute yeah, asylum seekers um, receive. Uh, 75 billion dollars per year of benefits from the rest of the world, while 90 percent receive only five billion dollars. And so he argues that instead of um, if the, the, effectively the money would be best spent being sent to local countries, um, and that it and so I suppose the extension would be that spending money on expensive designs in the West um, is it's very economically inefficient and it doesn't produce the maximum benefit. 
And so I'm wondering how can sort of an ethical or rights-based approach um, provide an answer to something which might be economically very efficient, but perhaps sort of would contribute to sort of colonial processes that are continuing to go along. And then secondly, if this is the case, is this a question that architecture can answer, or is that something different? Thanks, and uh, I've enjoyed each of the presentations, and I've been trying to wonder how they might uh, relate to one another in some kind of a coherent way, and, and, and uh, because each one of them has a uh, perspectives, and, and I'm trying to kind of comprehend how the human rights laws uh, uh, discourse is related to uh, architecture in camps or architecture in conflict transformation situations. And I'm kind of struggling at the moment, and, and yet I found one of the things that Delia said to uh, be a concept that's fairly uh, well established in different fields of, uh, of, uh, well, uh, of work related to these issues, which is, is that of uh, peace building. And it means so many things, uh, uh, and yet it also has this uh, construct of building, which is central to architecture. And I haven't seen an architectural development of the concept of peace building that relates to the field that uh, the, what the people in the conflict uh, and peace studies movement do in peace building. I think there's a lot of potential here, and I'm curious what to hear what the panel thinks. Thanks. I think you should answer the question as rather than just attacking them because they might go in different directions. So whoever has an answer to the question of this gentleman has to answer it now. Sounds like not to me. Yeah. Um I appreciate all the questions very much. I think I perhaps could speak a little bit more to the last question. Um, so this is precisely, I think, what the larger project that I'm working on attempts to do, to under, un uncover the, um, the, 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 the extent to which uh, a spatial conceptualization, but also the extent to which spatial practices are implicated in the term peace building itself. And I trace it from the 1990s um, to a number of different figures, including uh, Boutros Ghali, who I pictured uh, in, in the presentation, the former UN Secretary General, through to um, f foremost peace thinkers, including John Paul Lederach. Lederach. Yeah, okay. exactly. Right, and who used explicitly uh, architectural metaphors and the construction process to describe what peace building might be. So I, I look at that ethic, I think, um, really critically for me is to look at the materialization, the materiality, and the spatiality of ethics. Not only um, as a way of understanding what ethics might be, how we should live, um, but also to evaluate and interpret uh, the impacts of practices that are organized in, in the name of an ethic. Very quickly, uh, actually on the same issue, and then I'll come back to this. Um, I think that uh, peace building might work for some purposes, uh, particularly post-conflict. But uh, if you're looking at refugee issues as a broader one in which you are looking at not only the ethics of how do you respond to refugees once they become refugees, but also how do you actually respond, you know, act in the first place to prevent refugee flows? How do you deal with the structural issues that you all referred to and I talked about? Uh, peace building may, uh, may not be sufficient. There is a second issue which is that uh, peace building is typically used in the context of uh, post-conflict states, uh, that's an international terminology, but as I said, it, by and large, right now, there are a lot more internally displaced people compared to refugees, and they also have similar issues concerning, you know, for example, conflicts with communities, how do you actually rebuild, and the resettlement issue comes up all the time between host communities and, and uh, so-called internal refugees. We've seen that in this country with after Katrina, for example. Uh, and these issues have to be captured through some other uh, framework as well. But very quickly on the economic uh, side of uh, migration, um, 
the is that a rights based approach? Uh, I would think that I hope I would hope that there is uh, a purely economic case for migration has actually been made long time ago. In fact, uh, OECD and the World Bank have published volumes establishing the positive benefits of migration, agreed upon migration between countries, firmly establishing, for example, that uh, migration of all types have a net benefit between countries. Uh, so that's not an argument that we need to make anymore. The intellectually, that argument is over. The issue is to figure out how to operationalize that particular insight in a way that actually assures governments that still believe that as a government they need to have some security over their borders. And others who believe that in fact you can benefit by agreements between countries where people can transit through. So perhaps the global migration compact has to deal with issues like that. And I think the argument is not so much of what migration is good and what they come in. It's about how you spend the money which is spending on refugees and whether it's best spent in the West where it's more expensive or it's more efficient to spend those resources. Right. Although uh, the most of the money that is in, because the word migration signifies that we're talking about a larger category of people, not just refugees. And for example, you're talking about voluntary migration for economic reasons. I did, I think they're very, very Right, right, right. Uh, perhaps that's a much more limited issue, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe, I don't know, maybe picking up from this very last um, discussion, also trying to challenge the idea that um, this is also part of this peace building and humanitarian intervention, you know, to say we have to spend money there because, you know, so they do not come here. Actually, it's exactly the opposite, you know, there will be an increasing, of course, because the more people have access to things and the more, you know, they will be mobile, I would say, fortunately. So, and I think we are still struggling, and that's why maybe, you know, I would like to challenge also the idea uh, of, of trying still to frame, you know, refugees as a sort of crisis, as something that, you know, exploded just, you know, some years ago, and um, and framing this, you know, also historically, and, and, and to me, uh, it's important, you know, to, to see uh, that, and, and, yeah, I have to say, how I'm uncomfort uncomfortable thinking there is like, something that can be called, you know, this architecture of peace, of, of peace building, because it, I, I cannot see how that could have a critical angle that recognize that we are dealing with, um, you know, larger colonial present situations that, and, and, and I see this so-called migration of refugee crisis as, as, you know, part of, you know, empire that collapse and why people are so surprised that, the, you know, the same people who are part of this empire now are going back to, uh, they want to go to the metropolis. I, I don't understand, you know, why we don't see that as a larger 500 year of uh, colonization of Western society. And it's a time, you know, and this will be painful and, and it's happening. And it's a time in which, you know, the, the kind of white privilege, you know, will be, uh, should be put into questions. And instead of, you know, uh, turning again the situation as if that is a kind of things that can be fixed and, and it is a problem that, you know, um, uh, as Israel is trying to do with the wall, now we have Trump, you know. Um, instead of understanding, you know, things in this way and reacting in this way, I think we have to start recognizing to build an, you know, an understanding of that as, as, uh, as something that has, can be traced back to, um, to, to years ago. And because that starts then fundamental question about, you know, uh, sovereignty. It's, it's funny for me to see, you know, I have to say, sorry if that sounds too polemical, but, you know, this is what I believe. But, you know, that someone that was a migrant itself, you know, can claim sovereignty in this country, I really don't get that. It really disturbed me. But I understand that, you know, for some people that is normal. That someone, you know, that was himself a migrant, today wants to decide who, who can be in and outside of this country. I mean, what about the native population of this country would say? I mean, where where we start this conversation? Where we where do we start? I want to start, you know, in the for me what it seems important about these claims, you know. Unfortunately, I have to say I I'm I'm rather optimist on this, 
because you know before we could not have these conversations. You know, I, I still think you know it's very delicate, and I see that some of my friends, you know, when I start talking this way, they became very irritated. I, I you know, I, I'm learning that. But also I feel finally it's a conversation is happening, you know, that we start to have an historical perspective on events, on, on events that happen, you know. And then really asking fundamental question, I mean, who has the right of, say, you know, deciding who can be in and who can be out? And to me also this idea that someone, you know, about hospitality of refugees and asylum, I mean, if you see that in a different frame, you know, for example, I think about Italy, Italians, they don't have any perception when people left Libya, what was the colonial relation that Italy had with Libya? They don't see, they don't know, they don't, you know, there is no acknowledgement that Italians, you know, that uh, um, uh, displaced two-thirds of the population of Libya. It was involved there, not only in colonialism, it was the worst colonialism because it was fascist colonialism. So, they invented camps, you know, they, they used the Italian words to describe the, the, the way in which you, you fence places. Why? Because that's what you know, Italy brought. And now if they see a mi so-called migrant living a boat from Italy, they don't put this in that colonial conditions that you know, made Italy what is it today. So I think that is to me a conversation needs to happen. So, yeah, Alessandro, I, I think, so to, to sort of uh, think about you know, the top-down approach, uh, you know, whether it's a framework that, that is at, uh, at the, the scale of the state or at the scale of uh, the, at the global scale, uh, it seems that you know, a lot of uh, uh, problems remain unsolved on the table, you know, whether you know, people are really looking for ethical positions or are looking for overarching economical uh, interests. So I'm wondering you know, whether you can talk about you know, another approach, which is a sort of bottom-up approach, a very concrete and you know, very specific interventions, and, and maybe your, your practice in particular in this camp, how, uh, how is your contribution, how is your uh, intervention uh, related uh, to, this, uh, 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 to this question of, you know, building a possible future within a camp that is already a kind of territorial uh, aberration. What, what, what I mean is, if, how, how, how do you how can you, you know, how through your practice you, are you able to both uh, have a, posi a critical position uh, but at the same time provide a space for people, and you know, how can there is a sort of paradox there uh, that that I, I totally understand that you know you, you sort of uh, uh, you know try to work out this paradox, but I'd like to hear a little more a little bit more about you know what is this school for, and you know, what's the general framework, and what's the future of that school, and is that the correct uh, the correct response? Yeah. Without this sounds it's also. A very big question, so I'm not sure I have the answer for these questions. But um, let's say something that it, it really, um, let's say, was something that helped us to, to guide you know these processes that, by the way, are always very compromised from the very beginning. You know, and this is why I said you know it was important. I was interested to come here today because you know, and going back also to the ethical questions, I think no one could claim. Uh, in the moment you decide to step in in a situation you know, that you are um, uh, you know, in a kind of um, position you know, which you would not make a mistake or actually you are contributing. You know, that is all the dilemma of all these NGO organizations. You know, how much they are perpetuating certain situation but also how much is trying to challenge. So, first of all, it's a very, very compromised situation. Uh, where actually the ethical questions are very important, you know, are very important, you know, how much, why, uh, there is moment, and this also it seems to me that fortune is changing, you know, how also among actors, finally, you know, they start to say no, you know, imagine in our professions as architects, we only say yes, and we have even architects say the yes architecture of, of things like that, you know, it's obscene, you know, you know the profession is so clear that you, you actually, you, you question the things that you are, uh, you know, doing. And I hope that one day, you know, there will be a, a tribunal for, for a court for people that participate 
to these crimes. You know, and they should go to jail, not because they just have you know, a project in that country and it was in occasions for them. I think this has to do in the way also how we, uh, there is a process that has to happen you know, in the way how we frame problems. And for me, one of the key words is definitely the words of decolonization, because that not, is not just you know, the struggle of the 60s, people getting rid of the colonial empire, but this was also about you know, how the white society are still framing things, you know, and we are still participating in understanding problems using the same colonial framework. I think that is something different, that this world today, in that specific situations, I want to understand the refugees transgressing borders as a fight for decolonization that is not happening now anymore in the uh, Kashba of Algeria, is actually happening on the border and the Mediterranean. That is where it's happening. I only can see that. That for me gives me a different perspective in the way how I can work instead of, you know, at the best having this bad intention to say, you know, we have to asylum and all this hospitality. What hospitality? That is a right, you know. With all what Europe did and never paid for this, I mean, that would be the, the you know, the minimum that, 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 that needs to happen, you know, in that sense. So I think, and this is a work that in an academia setting, for example, you know, this is a discussion that, uh, that we have to have. I mean, well, let, me, let me follow up one second on that, because uh, it's true, architecture is always complicit, no? and maybe complicitness it's, it's a, it's an, is an interesting word to discuss here, right? Because um, what I found in fascinating about your presentation was when you were starting to talk about the, the camp as that space that is a city, but it's not a city, it's, a, it's dense, but it's uh, but it has like walls around. So like um, and, and, and 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 what is fascinating about your practice is actually that can you can understand the, the intervention that, that that you and your team has produced is somehow and um, can be understood as an experiment that can be applied to make to two different situations, right? Where ethics are applicable, where where conflictivity is is in like in front of you, and where complicitness is inevitable. Right? And, and, and I, I think that that's, uh, that's what it's, it's interesting for me to understand um, what you were saying about how ethics are starting to become part of the discussion. Right? And because suddenly like, all these elements that you, have, you needed to discuss and you needed to have because it was like, uh, necessary almost, um, becomes almost like a model. Right? So I think that for me that is where the, the practices like yours can become like a certain constructing certain models of operations that of course like uh, inevitably will have to be modified and, and, and tested out etc cetera, etc cetera. but but I feel that when, when we're talking about ethics it, they, they don't go beyond the fact of looking at specific practices that have been operating with complicitness or inevitably negotiating complicitness and looking how that can be operative elsewhere. All right, so one last question, and then we are out of time. Um, thank you for this last point. Mamdouh Mamdani wrote very beautifully about this decolonization. You might want to look at it, but Trevor Noah, the comedian, has a clip that I would suggest that everyone watches about the effect of post-colonization or um, uh, decolonization and the relationship of refugees to the countries that colonized them in the beginning. I have two very specific questions, one to Delia and one to Alessandro. Um, Delia, I want to go back to the point that uh, somebody said that we are past it and we don't want to go back to it, but it seems to me that it's an extremely important one, and that you said at some point that ethics cannot exist in radical separation from politics. Um, but this is sort of like an, a relationship of equality, in a sense, in the statement that you have given in here. I would actually challenge you to think through saying politics cannot exist without ethics, but ethics has to be able to exist without politics. Has to be actually able to exist pre-politics in order to inform politics, because once you relativize ethics, we lose that notion that Raj was speaking about, which is the uh, notion of, uh, not Raj actually, I'm sorry, that El Hadi was speaking about, that if you want peace you have to cultivate justice, and justice, the, the basic principle of justice is that it has to be universal, so I would cling to the claim of a universal ethics as the basis of ethics, rather than a relative ethics, whatever that is. The application perhaps is different, but we need to be able to have principles. 
And if I may answer my question to Alessandro, because it's related, it's very much related, as a matter of fact. You had this collective dictionary, and uh, I collected from the image that you have common vision, responsibility, relations, well-being. Um, some 25 years ago, two thinkers in Syria did a book that was supported by the European Union. It was called um, The Basis of Citizenship. And the basic, one of them was actually a thinker, the other was a painter, artist. And the painter, artist rendered these principles and the, um, and the thinker was actually writing down very watered down, but still very intelligent definitions of what is a citizen and what are the rights of citizenship. You have been speaking about that very difficult situation Palestinians found themselves in, in the camp, being non-citizens but having a land that they can call home, camp in this case. What are you trying to do with this collective dictionary? Are you developing sort of like some principles for a different definition of the individual relationship to the collectivity and to the land on which he or she are living that is not citizenship given the fact that citizenship is denied the Palestinians in the camps. Um, no, thank you for your question. And I appreciate that very much. It's something that is a central conflict to the work that I'm engaging with. And I think a lot of our work as well as we encounter these different circumstances different circumstances and situations in which we have um, some severe ethical challenges and that require political solutions, but also, also a kind of return to a set of principles that might guide through um, political obstacles. And then exactly, That's yeah. So my point here, I guess, is that um, one, that um, ethics and politics should remain in radical dialectical tension. Right, that the universal and the particular should always inform each other. And so that's why I at first say that they should be not radically considered that's separate. That's a much better phrasing than the one that I was going at. They should be in radical dialectical tension. In the same way that we could start to question um, who defines the universal, for whom and at whose cost, right? And in that sense, the particular is always informing the universal, but also the universal is also informing the particular and holding the particular to account particular sets of values within a particular society, let's say, that would seem to di diverge from what we might consider to be you know, ethical or morally permissible. Uh, so I, I consider them in radical tension um, in that sense. Um, <coughs> I'll leave it there. There were other parts of this conversation, but I want to leave Alessandra some time to, to talk. It's OK. Mm -hmm. Um, so very quickly, um, what is a collective dictionary? I say f four fundamental things, um, and maybe some of them are also changing, you know, with time because it was a, such an incredible uh, work that you know I think I'm I'm still reflecting on. First, it was the idea, as I said, you know, to say what is a camp, because you know we don't know what is a camp. It's, it, it's, it's strange, but you know, it's, uh, the first desire was that, uh, for me, was really to understand and to see the camp as a source of knowledge. Uh, not to say this is like just garbage, these are just marginalized, you know, this is just humanitarianism, we know all of that. You know, I, I think we, we have to accept that uh, these are incredible uh, places in which knowledge is, uh, is produced, and I would say also political structures. The second thing, which is fundamental, is I saw the power in the participants in campus in camps when they recognized they were creator, creators of meanings. Some of them you know, have been in normal universities. And this, the knowledge that they get from these universities alienate them from their realities. They were going back to their places, and they didn't know what to do with that knowledge. What we did at campus in camps that to me was the most tangible things and was so difficult to explain to the German development because they want to know, you know, to give us some tangible thing. The tangible thing was that the moment they made the click that they see themselves 
as their own experience, whatever they was were experienced, but in a way that they they can actually define what they see, define the world, uh, the world that is around surrounding them, and there are actually some people listening to them because they start them to invite them in Birzeit University, in Al-Quds University, in other universities in Palestine to talk, to speak, you know, you start to realize how much that is actually an incredible, uh, powerful tool. Because, you know, they, they start to do something that they didn't know that were actually able to do it. And, and, you know, I don't have time now to explain the whole process, but it was very painful because they had, you know, we all have to go first into an unlearning what we think we know, and then we can relearn you know, what actually we experience and, and, and bridge a little bit the gap between our experience in the world and the way how we speak about the world. Um, the third thing, of course, is to say what we discovered there is not just important from the camp. You know, from the camp, I really understood, for example, why, you know, I've studied in university or let's say in a political environment which the public was always good. You know, if you do something for the public, it's always great. I realized that the public, you know, in a colonial context, is actually your enemy. So, and then, you know, it opened up completely a different understanding then of, I cannot live between the private and the public because in between, there are so many forms of collectivity. And because we are stuck into this nation state idea, we think there is only private and public. And we don't recognize that, for example, in Palestine, during, during the Ottoman Empire, you have the Masha, you have so many different collectivity, and to me, the camp is today maybe a new form to think about the mashab. You know, a form of collectivity that is not, you know, it's not state-based, and it's not private. It exists only because people like in the mashab were farming the land. Now they are in the camp, and they are producing something that can be collected. So, for example, in English it's translated like the common, but, you know, that was a discussion that happened, that was a word in Arabic. And imagine also how that was for them so important to say, you know, I know something. I can, I can write something about this, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm not just this, you know, uh, refugee that doesn't know anything, right? So that was very, very important. And, and then the last thing is a phrase that, you know, because we were doing this and we didn't know really also how we collectively were understanding that process. And, and, and some of them, you know, interpret that as a way to write or rewrite, you know, what is look like a constitution. And this, I thought, you know, it was also a very powerful moment which they understood that we're organizing not just, you know, a small group, but they were trying to make sense of the political institutions that exist in the camp, you know. And that, for example, is again, is not just important in the camp when we want to think about what is beyond the nation state. I mean, how you organize a community in which the state is not involved. And the very last point, you know, to say how that is important, we understand only refugees through the state, you know, what the state does. If you look at the history, I mean, this is, again, it's not new. So when there were no states, actually, you know what, were people, the tribe, in the Arab world, for example, how is important the hospitality beyond the state? You know, if someone knock at your door, that is a political relation, it's a social relation, that is something that exists that you can accept or not, and you build. But since there is a state, we don't have that power. You know, actually, what they do in Europe, if you do it, you are in prison. They get you to prison. You know, if you decide, you know, to, to get someone that, you know, is illegal and all of that. You see, we built a crazy world. Meanwhile, before, you know, that was, you know, an agency that you have. We have been removed, so the problem is not the refugees. The problem is the citizen that, you know, they, we didn't realize that there is an erosion of what the citizen actually can do. We, can, we are not even allowed to have people in our private space. Imagine that, you know, we get to this point that we can be criminalized because we are hosting someone. So my point is that from the refugee camp, you can understand, you know, not only the figure of the refugees, but actually how, a, you know, as a citizen, you can regain, for example, the right to hospitality. I want to have the right to have someone in my house, you know, and not be feeling that, you know, we are illegal. At Calais, there are people who have been, you know, arrested and persecuted because, you know, they were hosting people in their private space, the most sacred space of this capitalist society. And that is where the contradiction, you know, explodes in our face. What is a camp? It looks like a city, but it's not. It doesn't look like a, 
a clamp, but it is one. I like, I like very, this formula very much. I can see the red light uh, blinking, and I think we are out uh, of time. I would like to thank Alessandro, Carlos, Delia, Raj, and Admi for this uh, great discussion. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon.